Hello! Probably no one. My name is Mad Dog, and I run this cosplay YouTube channel called Telekinetic Maniac. Recently, and by recently I do mean recently, I- it, it was in May, I did- I did it recently in May, it was many months ago, don't worry about it, it was recently. I made a giant ass anime sword for my Guts cosplay from the Golden Age of Berserk. It's very- it's- I can't fit it on screen, it's six foot one. And when I did that, I- I got an absolute- oh, a ton of questions about how I made this sword. So today I am like laying all my cards on the table. Like I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go over, over this sword, like start to finish every little thing. Hopefully if I can remember every little thing, I'll be, I'll go over every little thing. And as a bonus, I will also be talking about how if I were to redo this build now, knowing all of the things that I learned when I made it originally, how I would make it better. But, 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 but Mad Dog, didn't you, didn't you win a thing with your Guts cosplay? Like a, a best overall craftsmanship in the 2022 Anime Boston Masquerade thing? <laughs> Why yes I did, and you know what? You, you, you are gonna learn in this video how to make a giant ass anime sword that is better than a best overall craftsmanship giant ass anime sword. <laughs> this new sword is gonna be so durable so smooth, so shiny, it's so giant ass anime sword. <laughs> they are gonna scoff at mine. Also, as I know, when I say you're gonna learn how to make a giant ass anime sword, I do mean like it, you're not limited to guts from the golden age of berserk. Like you're not limited to that sword. Like the, these techniques can be applied to a lot of, a lot of massive, crazy, stupid, giant ass anime swords. So do with that while you will. Time codes for specific stuff in the description of the video. And, uh, let's get started. So, to start off, I need to give some background on this cosplay because Guts is actually one of the cheapest cosplays I've ever made. It's made with a hodgepodge of leftover items, gifted items, one gift certificate that I won, and then I did get one new cut of leather for this cosplay. And I will be regretting that for forever. I didn't really understand how much leather was in one hide of leather. I have so much leather left over, please send help. And the reason I did this is because of the old panini. You know how it is. Um, I was just very, very limited in what materials and techniques I could use at the time I was making this costume. Like I'm always limited, I always got my budget, but like, and then on top of that, when I decided that I wanted to make this costume specifically for the Anime Boston Masquerade, I became even more limited with materials and techniques I could use because of Anime Boston security. Up through 2019, Anime Boston security check has always been a nightmare. It has always been the toughest security I've ever seen at any convention anywhere. Like y'all, I'm not joking when I say, I have stood in line waiting to get my prop checked, like, you know, me and my little Yona bow or something, right? And I have just sweat through my costume, waiting in the line, like, as I'm, as I'm inching closer, because I just watched the security guards, like, huck other people's gorgeous props into a giant dumpster because one tiny, tiny little thing on their prop was a miss. Like, one tiny thing didn't make it through security, so, like, it, it, it is rough. <laughs> To explain this in the easiest way possible for those of you who don't know Anime Boston security, um, either because you haven't been to the con or you just haven't gone through prop check itself, Anime Boston has always operated under the idea that like if you were to swing your prop at something or someone and your prop could hurt that something or someone without hurting itself first, like essentially without having the prop itself shatter, it won't be allowed into the convention. So things like really stiff, bulky EVA foam, not allowed. Any sort of 3D printed item, like solid plastic, not allowed. Even if you have like a sturdy core in the center of something that's more delicate, not allowed. The prop itself has to snap before it could be a danger to anything. And that is of course until this year. <laughs> this year, thanks to the old Padini, <laughs> Anime Boston had extremely lax security, but I, did not know that until I got to the convention. We got to that convention and my friend Zach, he like walked up to security with this giant metal like switch axe 
thing from Monster Hunter and they, they just like were like, yeah, I mean, I don't know what that is. Bring it inside. <laughs> like in previous years, Zach would have just been told, get the f out. <laughs> like they wouldn't have even put it in the dumpster. That would have been too hazardous. But thanks. Thanks to the world happening, um, staff was just so much more lax. There was just fewer of them. It was so clear they were overworked. Like, I'm so sorry to the Heinz staff. But yeah, it resulted in them being very lax. But I didn't know that, so I made this prop with the knowledge of Anime Boston security years prior. So this prop, like this boy right here, looks so flippin' cool. So, like, he's so bloody, fake bloody, Susan, it's fake blood. He's so cool and bloody and awesome and big and giant, but he's also like my little delicate little baby because this, I like, I can barely like lean him up against a wall without him like just bending. But so what that means in technical terms is that I made this sword with a PVC core <laughs> surrounded by pink insulation foam. And you did hear that right, I said PVC <laughs> core. So like, <laughs> PVC. So uh, he wobbles a little bit, he bends, he bends a little bit. <laughs> and I mean, it's fine, it's fine for the 2019 Anime Boston security. Didn't matter at all for 2022 Anime Boston security, but it's fine. <laughs> but so theoretically, if I were to make this sword for uh, not crazy Anime Boston security, but like regular con security, like probably like every other con ever would be fine with this. <laughs> One of the biggest and easiest changes that I would make to the sword right off the bat is I would switch the PVC core for a solid wood one. This is actually the core that I was originally going to use until I got really scared about anime boss and security for no reason at all, apparently. But yeah, nice and sturdy, does does not bend. Like it's it's wood, it's solid wood. And I just I'd highly recommend something like this instead of PVC. Side note, should I make Dragon Slayer with that? Because like I have it, like I have the wood and then I like also have like extra pink insulation foam. Should I just do it just like for the hell of it? Should I make Dragon Slayer? Put it in the comments. Although I do say that and I've debated a long time on whether or not I would actually use pink insulation foam again while making this sword, like just with the wood core because it would definitely work with pink insulation foam. Like it would work better than with the PVC core. But for a prop this giant, like while it would work, I think I would either want to finish it completely differently or use EVA foam instead. Because, and you'll be able to tell exactly why later in this video, but because of all the finishing products and paints that I used on this prop when I was done like fabricating it and whatever, the prop itself struggles with handling its own weight. Like it's overall a really light prop, but it is also like a somewhat flexible prop and it, it's, it just struggles. Like I said, he's, he's just my little guy. He's just the delicate little guy, okay? <laughs> you know, I could recommend pink insulation foam or EVA foam for a couple reasons, but I recommend you wait till the end of this video before you make a decision on what material you want to use because there's there's just like this, this little this little tiny thing that you, you may want to know. It's kind of really important. Just like, just wait till the end, okay? <laughs> but whatever material you choose, you'll have a much better time using it with a wood core rather than a PVC one. So with those words of warning out of the way, so many words, I did, were they warning? Were they just word? This is how I made my sword, finally. So this sword is essentially, not quite, but I will, I will explain that later. This sword is essentially two layers of pink insulation foam sandwiched around a PVC core. So we got a pink foam and PVC sandwich with the pink foam as the bread and the PVC as what you put on your sandwich. <laughs> to create the sandwich, I had to first make a pattern, then cut two large identical pieces of pink foam. Then I had to create a channel uh, along the center of each piece of pink foam to glue the PVC into. Um, and then of course I had to glue it all together. To make this pattern, I had to essentially draw the silhouette minus the handle, because the handle is just the, it's just the PVC sticking out, right? Um, and I also didn't draw the guard because I added that later on. So to do that, I taped a bunch of paper together and drew a rectangle and added like some sorty details, like like a line in the middle for a fuller and, and like there's a triangle at the end. It wasn't that interesting and this is this is the result. Like I, I'm sure you can find a way to make a rectangle or acquire one. <laughs> then I traced that pattern onto the pink foam, which I cut out with a box cutter. And bear in mind, I have a little bit of excess on the sides when I'm cutting out with a box cutter. That way 
Um, there's essentially like a seam allowance there that when I'm sanding and shaping the sword later on, like I can sand to the line, uh, the pattern line that I want, as opposed to potentially over sanding it. Except when I say I cut out two large sheets of pink foam, that's not exactly what I mean. <laughs> it's definitely easiest to trace and cut out two pieces for sandwiching on one gigantic continuous sheet of pink foam. Uh, and it's easier to conceptualize that at first, which is why I've been saying just, just two pieces will be the bread of our sandwich. But here you'll notice that I have these pink foam squares, which make the idea of cutting only two large pieces impossible. I have these because they're smaller and easier to transport and store and whatever, like just so much easier than the giant sheets. But to make them work for this project, I had to cut up my pattern into a couple pieces, trace those pieces onto the foam, and then splice the foam pieces together. So instead of having just two large pieces for the bread of the sandwich, I had three per side, which I glued together to make the, the two large pieces. It's a little bit more time consuming to do the splicing and extra gluing, but if you, like me, don't have a lot of space to store foam and still want to make a sword like this, you may want to take a similar route. To embed the PVC on what became my two pieces of pink foam, I measured out the middle of each piece and cut a very basic thin channel into the middle. I then refine the channel with my Dremel because it's the most efficient thing for me to do, but if you don't own a Dremel or another rotary tool, you can absolutely refine your channel with just a box cutter. It'll probably just take a bit longer. Up next is gluing. I used liquid nails to glue this, but you can use really any type of glue that works on insulation foam. Although, uh, author's note, <laughs> contact cement will eat your foam, so don't use contact cement. I know it's a staple for cosplay, but not for this. Generally when making a foam sandwich like this, you just want the channel to be half as deep as the size of your core, so that when you glue the core, sandwiching it into the two channels, all the pieces will join with the core placed evenly in the middle. And then obvs, you don't want it to go all the way to the end on one side, but you do want it to stick out the other side so that you, you like have a nice little handle for your, your blade. But for me, this is where things just get a little bit more convoluted than a pink foam and PVC sandwich sword. I decided partway through that I wanted my sword to be just a smidge like larger, like 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 thicker, larger, not taller, it's already gigantic, than the two pink foam pieces put together. So I also added in this weird layer of EVA foam around the PVC core and in the middle of the two pink foam pieces. This added a little bit of extra material I needed and also provided a very sturdy blade edged sand to. Instead of having to worry about the pink foam going together perfectly at the edges or losing the crisp blade edge when sanding, I cut the EVA foam to the exact shape I wanted the edge to be so that when I, when I shaped everything, when I sanded it down to look like a sword later, I could just blend the pink foam right into the EVA foam. To get the shape of the sword out of what was now just this big rectangle with a handle, I did some sculpting work with my box cutter and sandpaper. I used the box cutter to rough out the shape of the blade and the channel for the fuller, and then I used the sandpaper to refine and smooth everything down. I took a lot of time <laughs> with this step, <laughs> just making sure that everything was shaped really nice and smooth and just how I wanted it, and I even did some quick little fills with ready patch just, just to make sure everything was perfect. I'd really recommend taking your time with this step because this, this is it! This is where you make the blade. It's not that complicated to do, but it's also only as good as you sculpt it. And if you sand it to be all wavy or like, like, I don't know, like lumpy or something, <laughs> it sure is gonna look like that instead of a nice crisp sword. I'd also highly recommend using a sanding block for this step, just so you aren't accidentally rounding your blade to the shape of your hand. The one that I'm using for the blade is store-bought, but you can you can literally just tape sandpaper to a piece of planed wood. Like, it, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. And for the fuller, where I needed a much thinner sanding block, that's actually what I did. I also want to recommend for this step, you do the fuller before the blade edges, the way I did. That way you don't have to worry about the sword rolling around, like, on, on the surface you're working on, when you shape the fuller. I know you may be hyped to make the blade. <laughs> But trust me, delaying your gratification just like a little bit, it'll be worth it. Because this sword is made of pink foam and not EVA foam, you can't just seal it and paint it with anything with a spray or like the aerosol is like, it's just gonna eat your foam. 
So the next thing that I did was cover this bad boy in Mod Podge. Uh, specifically Mod Podge filled with glitter because if you get glitter near Mod Podge one time, just one time, it's gonna be glittery forever, baby! <laughs> I wanna say I did like five layers of glitter Mod Podge all over. Uh, and yeah, that seems to work fine. Uh, I've also seen people do this with like wood glue, honestly, various, various glues or glue and water combos. Uh, I just did Mod Podge because I had it lying around and didn't really know when I was going to be able to use glitter Mod Podge, but it's hiding in a paint job, I can use it now! Alright, alright, drum roll, please. Are you ready for the stupidest part of the creation process for this sword? Because I don't think you are! Get this! Get this! <laughs> the next thing that I did was spray my Mod Podge encased sword with spray filler primer, which like it's like the Mod Podge is supposed to protect it from the spray. Like it was a good idea. Like I, th I mean, I thought it was a good idea. So like it's supposed to protect the sword, right? And it did protect the sword, but it did not protect the sword from, get this, Massachusetts weather. <laughs> Yeah, so I did spray the filler when it was like absolutely way too cold and it sure, it just, it cracked like 2011 crackle nail polish. Which was what the kids call not ideal. <laughs> Almost as unideal as me alienating the main demographic of Gus cosplayers by making a 2011 crackle nail polish joke. But that is exactly what it looked like. <laughs> and it was unfortunate. So there I was with my crackle nail polish sword, thanks to 30 degree weather and also probably not helping was the fact that I used glossy Mod Podge instead of making the final layer like with a with a matte coat, that probably would have been smart. But thus began the long process of filling in my mistakes. Don't be like me folks, use that matte glue for your final coat, spray your filler primer in a temperature within the directed range on the can. Or maybe don't even use spray filler primer, maybe just, just brush it on yourself, just don't be like me. Make your sword better than mine. <laughs> Anyway, so much ready patch was was used, like just half a can gone, just like that. Even like even freeform air was used to try to to try and help it out a little bit. <laughs> it was sanded down. I did many many more layers of filler or primer to make sure everything was totally smoothed down again. But eventually things things all worked out, <laughs> and it was ready for final details, a final coat of primer, and then the paint job. And this right here is unfortunately when I stopped filming because it. I, you know, so here's, here's the thing. I, it, tr I con crunched. I just, it truly, I con crunched. It was bad. I forgot to film. I was crunching. It was, everything was bad. I didn't want to, but it, sh it sure happened. But I do have photos of the work like in progress because I did remember to take photos for my build book and I will be doing a demonstration on exactly how I did the paint job. So you will not have to stare at my face for the rest of this video. <laughs> The final details of the sword were some dents where there were just there were just dents in the design. So what I did there is I just I cut I cut into the sword to make dents and then I, I primed those by hand. It's pretty self-explanatory, like you're you're not missing much there. And also the guard and the pommel. These details were made with EVA foam, freeform air, and some gigantic flippin' studs I found. But like for the record, these details can all be accomplished with just EVA foam if that's all you have on hand. The reason I used EVA foam, freeform air, and the giant studs is because I'm pretty new to working with EVA foam, um, and I knew that I could do it quickly with the three of those like combined and have like the finished result I want without having to spend a ton of time learning. So like it was ideal for me, but you, you can do it with just EVA foam. But yeah, for the guard, I essentially glued on a thick layer of EVA foam with some studs squished into it and used some freeform air to smooth out some rough edges. And for the pommel, I used some more EVA foam and freeform air to sculpt the weird like hexagon to cone shape. Nothing super fancy, you know, just, just some final touches. I also, <laughs> really last minute, decided that I wanted my PVC handle to be thicker. So I wrapped this like almost like dead disintegrated warbler that I had around it. Like it does not look pretty, but like it did make the handle thicker. But I would recommend to just get a piece of wood that's as thick as you want the handle to be initially. <laughs> Like just, like just avoid, avoid this step altogether. It is the better choice. <laughs> and also heads up, way at the end of this, after the paint job, I also ended up wrapping some tea dyed white 
fabric around the handle so that it wasn't the horrible warbler texture. Also, I'm pretty sure he just has wrap on the handle. Like, I think that's like, usually you like have something so that you're not just like holding metal. <laughs> After adding all of the final details, except for the fabric, I did one final coat of filler primer, which I sanded down all smooth. Then one coat of regular primer, which I also sanded down smooth. And then only after it was like super smooth and like all the dust was cleaned off and like I was I was sure it was ready, did I do the silver spray paint. I used this color for the main part of the blade and then this color for the inside of the fuller. Because oftentimes when you paint something solidly one color, you lose a little bit of the details. It often becomes very flat. So I used a different color to essentially bring back some of the, the depth of the fuller into the blade. I ended up using these paints because they were the closest in like color to the actual like aluminum sheet that I used for like my actual my actual cosplay armor for like the rest of the cosplay. And then after waiting multiple days because I was taking no chances with the Massachusetts weather again. <laughs> after that, I ended up using a semi-gloss finish also because it was the most similar to the finish on the aluminum. I absolutely loved how this looked alone. Like it just looked like a giant piece of metal. Like <laughs> a big hunk of iron, <laughs> as it were. But to completely finish the paint job, I also did some basic shading around the, the dents and the studs, where there would probably be like a little bit of grit on what's an otherwise very clean sword. I also did a ton of blood effects, that, cause that's the look I wanted. So I don't think you really need like a spray paint tutorial. Like you just, you shake the can up, you spray the thing. It's good. But Demo Mad Dog is going to take over from here and show you exactly how I did the blood effects on this sword. All right, paint tutorial time from this disembodied hand, I guess. I used these paints, which were just paints that I had like left over from a kit from like, I think when I was a kid. Um, this paintbrush, because it was pretty much what my brain was allowing me to use, there no other sizes were left. <laughs> and this sponge, uh, this little sea sponge, which I like a lot. I made it pretty much as organic as possible. So what I did is I just put out a bunch of different reds right on my paper plate, like so. And then obviously like I would do the I would do the real paint job on the on the sword, but like for, for the sake of this, it's just all gonna be on the paper plate. Um, so I just put out a bunch of bunch of different colors for like reds and browns and blacks and whites and whatever for variation and do note that this one looks absolutely disgusting because it is like fully fully expired um but essentially i did exactly what you're not supposed to do when you're painting and i just like kind of mixed everything together with my brush like really organically so i just take like a chunk of this and, and a little bit of this and I'd like mix it in like not fully, like add in some some different colors and whatever, just to try and make it look like it was like in all these different like stages of like congealing. And then what I'd do is I would take my little sponge and I'd just like dab it, dab it all over the sponge, right? And I'd go to the sword, imagine this is the sword. <laughs> and I'd go and I'd essentially make some organic looking spray pattern. And if I essentially saw a pattern that I liked, I would play with it, like I'd add to it more. So I'd take more of this like absolute mess of a, <laughs> of a palette um, and I'd just like, I'd start adding in with my little brush and I would try to dab it on thick to essentially add to the texture. And I would also take this very expired paint, mix it in as well to add to the texture. So I use the expired paint to both get it out of my paint box and because it was a great texture, but if you don't have expired paint to do this paint job with, cause I feel like most people don't just keep their expired paints. <laughs> um, essentially a great way to add texture is you can get one like literal dirt, like just, just straight up dirt from outside, from somewhere outside. Um, and you can mix it in with your paints. Um, or you can use things like kitchen spices. I know a lot of people use like cinnamon uh, to, to mix in and, to, and add some texture to their paint. Or I believe there are actually like pre-made textures that you can buy at like craft stores to add to paint jobs, you know? I don't know a lot about them because I'm not a painter, <laughs> but I, I believe that's a thing. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, like about these, these pre-made textures, um, feel free to add more information in the comments, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's like a, a Google away. But yeah, so I just, I just go to town with this at like adding, trying to make it look like organic. Uh, like I said, I'm sorry, this is not everyone's favorite word, but like I really wanted this to be 
a rather chunky paint job um, as opposed to streaky. Usually blood's rather streaky. Um, but for this, this sword, the size of it, I just, I didn't think the blood would streak so much as if Guts were to, you know, hit a fictional character, this fictional character probably wouldn't be sliced cleanly. They would probably be bashed and, you know, some stuff would happen because of that. It would, it, like, I just think this texture would be better than the regular streaky blood. So that's, that's how I did this. And I just like, you know, I just kept going with it. I just, I just kept adding until I like really liked the, the weird blob that I made. Uh, but yeah, so there it is. Uh, all my stuff ended up looking vaguely like this. I also did this part after I did the seal spray on my sword, um, because generally, um, when you're laying acrylic paint on this thick, it doesn't come off unless you're like actively chipping at it. And b because I did this like after, after the spray coat, it made it so that this was a different texture than the silver underneath, which I really enjoyed quite a bit. Um, if you want to be safe, obviously go for the, the finishing coat um, after <laughs> doing this paint job. But for me, it worked out really good. I didn't have any issues with it and like nothing chipped off. So that's personally what I would recommend. And yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty much it for this paint demo. Um, it's really, it's not crazy complicated, but it does get you some cool texture, and I hope it, I hope it inspires you for yours, even if this is not exactly the look that you want to go for. I hope it at least provides some inspiration. Yeah. Anyway, back to not paint demo, back to not paint demo, mad dog. <laughs> and here it is, folks, the final gigantic, massive change that I would make if I were to make this sword again, knowing what I know now. And honestly, just a word of warning to you all. If you use pink foam as your base, do not use any spray products with it. Just use all brush on products or like maybe airbrush products, but do not use any spray products. Brush on your glue or whatever primer or glue and primer. Brush on your base paint, brush on your sealer, just brush on everything. But on the other hand, if you use EVA foam, mix the glue layer all together, just finish your EVA foam with like heat or whatever, and then you can use as many spray products as you want. This is because I've learned that over time, because I made this costume in May, <laughs> it seems that whatever glue you use as a thing to protect your pink foam, when mixed with spray products, will bubble. I don't know the chemistry behind this, but I can see the bubbles. So I don't know if it's all spray products or just the ones I use, but like I wouldn't chance it unless you're a chemist. To be fair, this isn't like a massive problem with my sword because I've already competed with it, which is like when I wanted it to look its best. And you know, if I use it now for a photo shoot, I can, I can sit and repair it, like repaint it or just Photoshop it. But if you're making a sword and you want it to last, like for, for many conventions, because who wouldn't want a giant ass anime sword to last forever? Just take it to every event you go to. Please heed my advice and choose your materials carefully. So pink foam, no spray products. EVA foam, no glue, but you can't use spray products. For the record, after thinking about it over the course of this video, if I were to make a competition piece, I'd probably use EVA foam if I were to make a sword like this again. But if I'm making something just for me, just for cheap on the down low, I'll use the pink foam and, and brush everything on. Also, speaking of heating words of warning, please wear personal protective equipment like I did throughout this video. I think that should be like, that should be implied. Like everyone, sh you always wear, <laughs> always wear PVE, okay everyone? I think it's a given, but just, yeah, stay safe. Just gonna throw that out there, okay? <laughs> And there you have it folks, slap some fabric on that bad boy's handle and that's how I made my giant ass anime sword and how you can make an even better one. If you do make a better one, hey, feel free to tag me in it. I genuinely love when people are inspired from my little like tutorials and tips and whatever to make something of their own. Like it, it genuinely brightens my day to see what y'all have made. And if you liked this video, do give it the old Thumbs up, subscribe, comment, something stupid about a bell, <laughs> and share it with your friends. This is my first video in a really long while. I'll actually be talking about that in an upcoming video, just like whatever for now, just push, throw that away. And any help you can give me with the YouTube algorithm or by word of mouth would just be so powerful and greatly appreciated. More cosplay videos will be coming out on this channel soon, so do keep an eye out for them. Uh, but until then, I will see you on the con floor.
Possibly. Possibly I'll see you on the con floor. I still do not know what's up with cons for 2023, but like, you could possibly see me at a region 2023. You'll definitely see me at Katsucon 2023. I'll keep you posted on what con floor I'll be at. And then I'll see you on it, okay? <laughs> Bye. <laughs>